Welcome everyone to our weekly Share Cafe webinar, where we look to uncover some ASX listed micro and small cap hidden gems and connect those companies to our investor audience via the virtual conference. Your regular host, Tim McGowan from Share Cafe is unable to make it this week, so I'll be stepping in to host the webinar. A bit of housekeeping. You are able to ask questions of the presenters in writing using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And if you miss any of the presentations, don't stress too much as the webinar is being recorded and you will be able, you will be able to watch it via either sharecafe.com.au early next week or a link will be sent to you. The webinar has a real resources feel to it this week and we believe we've secured four exciting resources stories for your, as your presenters. Each presenter will present for approximately 10 minutes and then we will have question and answer time. So please use the Q&A function available to you to ask questions of the presenters. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Andrew Penkethman, MD and CEO of Ardea Resources, ASX code ARL. Andrew, over to you. Hi Dave, thanks for the introduction and yeah, really good to be here today. I'm just gonna provide an update on ASX listed Ardea resources and launch straight into the presentation. Next slide, please. And again, great. So just to cover off summary on Ardea, all of our projects are located, located here in Western Australia. That's a deliberate strategy. We, we believe Western Australia is at the forefront of safety operating and environmental procedures. It's the best jurisdiction to be located in. Our flagship Kalgoorlie Nickel Project is the largest nickel cobalt resource in the developed world. And in addition to the very large resource base, we've got an extensive tenure position covering over 5,000 square kilometres and a lot of large crustal scale structures cut through those tenements and they're also prospective for gold and nickel sulphide. So today I'll be giving you a quick update on the significant nickel cobalt resource base and saying a bit more about the work we've been doing on the gold exploration side. Next slide, please. Where are our projects located? Um, our core Kalgoorlie nickel projects are all within a hundred kilometre radius of the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder, which is the heart of the gold fields. Uh, we've got extensive infrastructure to our tenements and around our tenements, including road, rail, um, power, water in some instances, and uh, the gas pipeline. So um, just to reiterate, the favourable jurisdiction that Western Australia provides, the Fraser Institute survey that's um, recognised and respected around the world, Western Australia was rated the number one operating jurisdiction. If we could move to the next slide, thanks. So a bit more detail here on the Kalgoorlie Nickel Project tenements. And you can see the Goongarry Nickel Cobalt Project highlighted in purple. It's only 70 kilometres north of the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder. Very large resource position there, but um, most importantly, the, the global resource base for the entire KMP tenements is uh, 5.6 million tonnes of contained nickel. And to put that into perspective, the global nickel consumption per year is currently about 2.5 million tonnes. So you know, potentially our day's projects in and around Kalgoorlie could provide the entire world with, with nickel for more than two years. Uh, we touched upon um, a flagship Goongarry project. That's the most advanced project and it's our number one development option. We're working through a partnership process at the moment, but uh, feasibility study work undertaken thus far has included a pilot plant campaign. And you can see with the uh, image on the right, that's uh, nickel and cobalt sulphide produced from Goongarry. If we could move on to the next slide. So here we're looking at a uh, inclined plan view. So we're looking to the south. So in the right hand corner, you can see the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder. 
Um, if you could press uh, again and uh, three more times, a few features will come up. Thanks. So you can see our day as tenements highlighted in red, and that just sort of puts it into perspective the strategic land holding we've got in and around Kalgoorlie. Um, the known gold occurrences are shown in yellow, nickel occurrences in green, and in the bottom left, you can see the main Goongarri nickel cobalt resources, and they extend over a strike length of 25 kilometres. So in any style of mineralisation, you can see we've got very significant scale. And the other feature I'd like to highlight, you can see some thin yellow lines running south from Kalgoorlie and, and northwards through Goongarri, and that represents the Boulder Lefroy Fault that uh, runs and is a uh, northern extension of the Bardock tectonic zone. And that's very important because that structural architecture controls um, millions of ounces of gold mineralisation south of Cal and certainly up uh, further north to Menzies and, and uh, Adair are in the fortunate position of controlling 65 kilometres of stripe of that structural zone. If we could move on to the next slide. So we'll go into more detail about the exploration potential of our day's extensive portfolio now. Um, 5,100 square kilometres. Um, we're ramping up our nickel sulphide and gold exploration. And today I want to focus on some of the great work the exploration team's been doing on gold exploration in and around our Goongarri tenements. Next slide. So we're zooming in now on Goongarri. You can see um, our day's tenements and you can see the purple lines represent the um, Bardock tectonic zone. So I mentioned the significance of the Boulder Lefroy Fault and the Bardock tectonic zone and um, the fact that they control you know, significant gold mineralisation. And what's different about Goongarri is that we've got recent alluvial cover and the development of the laterite profile hiding the prospective basement rocks. So we, we've got to look under that cover to fully appreciate and discover new, new gold deposits. And that's been a focus for us over the last few months. So if we can move to the next slide. So here to put um, the area that Ardea controls at Goongarri in perspective, the uh, plan on the left shows the Goongarri Nickel Cobalt Project, then we've got Kandana and St Ives, you know, two very well-known gold camps in the eastern gold fields. Both Kandana and St Ives have um, either both in terms of historic production and um, currently defined resource, the gold endowment is greater than 10 million ounces. Goongarri, controlled by Ardea, is um, twice the area of Kandana and, and uh, covers a similar area to St Ives, but there's a lot more outcrop. Exploration um, historically has been far greater at Kandana and St Ives. Um, for at least the last 20 years, the focus at Goongarri has been on nickel cobalt resource definition and exploration. Um, we're really just getting into the gold potential now. So if we can move on to the next slide. So recently we uh, put out a maiden resource for a deposit we call Big Four, which is located in the centre of Goongarri. Uh, drilling completed in January, got some very encouraging intercepts such as 18 metres at 3.4 grams per tonne, 14 metres at 2.4 and 20 metres at 2.9. And we've defined a modest resource within five metres of surface. But um, Goongarri was found by historical prospectors and cropped out at surface, but the majority of our day's tenure is covered by that younger cover and the laterite profile. So the maiden resource at Big four, it's a modest start, but it's proof of concept of the gold mineralisation potential at Goongarri. Next slide, please. So looking at more detail here at some of the quality work completed by the, the Ardea team. So this is a geology plan and we've got big four located in the top left and there's our maiden resource. So the um, purple colours 
represent ultramafix. And then as we move to the right hand side of the plan, we're, we're looking at a mafix succession. And there's multiple drill hole results with anomalous gold within them. And our day is continuing to define literally well over 100 gold targets. And we're setting about systematically exploring those with big four, the first cab off the rank. Um, we've got a lot of more work to do, but it's a timely reminder to the market of you know the quality tenure our day I have and the sound technical work the team's completing. Next slide. So here to put it in perspective, we've got the geological survey of Western Australia, uh, one is to 100,000 mapping, and this is a fantastic data set and Western Australia provides um, public domain data that is globally competitive. But our data then take this quality work from GSWA and you look at the image on the right and we collect our own geophysical data, so it be airborne magnetics, um, and other geophysical techniques. We'll spend a lot of time and effort going through the historical records and taking a lot of information that's on um, old PDFs and just old paper reports and capturing that digitally and then doing our own detailed interpretation. So we've taken the da quality data that we started with and taken it to the next level. And within the Ardea team, we've got decades of um, gold experience. You know, most of us, started their career in Western Australia gold, such as myself, and we're looking at building upon uh, that skill and that base to unlock the full potential of our day as tenements. Uh, next slide, please. So this is drilling that's taking place at Goongarry at the moment. And what we call a regolith, that, that's all the, the piles of drill samples we see. So if you look at the bottom right of the photo, you see the red piles. So that's um, recent sands and gravels and lacustrine clays and surface geochemistry just simply can't see through that material. The results you get from surface geochem are meaningless. They have no bearing on the basement rocks underneath. So you've got to drill through that cover. So then in the middle of the image, we see the light pink and yellow colours. So that's deeply weathered saprolytic clays. And then on the left hand side we start to see the uh, dark green grey colours and we're getting into a mafic succession so within the gold fields the most common host rocks are, are mafic so you know we'll get geochemical samples right throughout this sequence and interact that with the geophysical data we've got and we'll apply the geology. So in exploration, we call it the three Gs, geology, geochem and geophysics. And we'll use all that data to unlock the geology. And, uh, you know, in my mind, it's just going to lead to more exploration success. You know, we've got the projects and, and people. Next slide, please. So just in closing, we touched upon the globally significant resource base that our day have for nickel and cobalt. We're very fortunate to have all our projects in and around Kalgoorlie so we can leverage off that infrastructure. We're looking for a strategic partner to develop our globally significant nickel cobalt resources, 100% off takes available. We're very much leveraged to the thematic of modern day minerals for growing society and take part in electric vehicle revolution. But what I wanted to really highlight today is don't forget about the prospectivity of our day's very large strategic land holding. Uh, the gold story is just unfolding with the Maiden Big Four resource. And we're also working up a nickel sulphide exploration pipeline. So we've got strong news flow expected throughout the rest of this year. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, Andrew. A great presentation. We always love a project that's close to home, um, particularly for me being a Kalgoorlie boy historically. Um, a couple of questions have come in. In terms of strategic partnership and that process, obviously you can't disclose uh, how the status of that is going and, and uh, how advanced or not you are, but can you give some guidance around what a strategic partner looks like, how involved groups are in, in, in talking to the company? Absolutely. So 
partnership process has been led by KPMG, who've been assisting our DAIA, and we're, we're talking to a range of groups from uh, large scale miners through to vehicle manufacturers through to the builders of these battery gigafactories. Um, they're all looking at securing strategic supply and it, it's, it's our view that you know no other company offers the optionality that, that Ardea has. Um, discussions are, are continuing, a uh, range of, of positive feedback and you know, what's mo most pleasing is that dialogue continues but we don't see a company saying oh you know we don't like your projects and going off and doing a, a deal with a um, a peer company, you know, we we adamant that it's just a matter of time, and we've got to ensure it's the right deal for our day. And um, we retain a very tight capital structure so that when the time's right, um, we can do the deal in the best interest of our shareholders. A great answer, and that did cover a couple of questions related to the ability to fund uh, some of the assets going forward and the partnership process. So I think you've dealt with that one adequately. Andrew, thanks for your time, a great presentation. Thanks very much, Dave. Our next presenter is Jeremy Robinson, Executive Director of Rarex Rare Earths, ASX code REE. -E. Jeremy, look forward to the presentation. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks everyone for joining me this afternoon. I'd like to run you through uh, the Rarex story, a relatively new and unfolding story. Uh, next slide, please. And again, so a little summary of what we're about. Um, we were born in the middle of last year as a rare earths company, uh, as a backdoor listing. I came in to, to take the role as executive director and brought in a rare earths project, the Cummins Range Rare Earth Project. As a, it had a 2004 jork resource. We spent some money and time converting that to 2012. And uh, we've been working on getting to a point of drilling that earlier this year before COVID-19 hit but we'll be ready to go again on that shortly. What else we have in the portfolio is some very, very exciting copper gold assets in New South Wales, which our joint venture partner, Kinkora Copper, is currently drilling for us. And we've had some exciting news out on that in uh, this week. And uh, we're 35% free carried in that project and a 10% equity holder in that, in that company as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the, the corporate structure of the company. We trade under the ticker uh, REE. Uh, the share price yesterday was 3.7. I believe we moved a bit higher this morning. Uh, have a good amount of cash. We're not spending a lot at the moment because our joint venture partner is uh, spending the money for us in New South Wales. And we have some listed investments in Kinkora Copper. Uh, valued at 1.6 on that slide, I believe, as of their close last night, that's somewhere between two and $3 million. Our board is very well credentialed, uh, led by the very experienced uh, John Young, who is the founder of uh, Pilbara Minerals, a very successful uh, spodumene producer in Western Australia here. And he's a very good guiding hand for me. And, and we have a, a number of other people on our board and management, which are very well credentialed and will help us uh, achieve our goals as a company. Next slide, please. So first I'll talk about the rare earth side of our business and then the second half of this uh, slide deck will be about the copper gold assets in New South Wales. Uh, Cummins Range is our flagship rare earth project. It's well located in the Kimberley region of Western Australia, which is uh, very well provisioned for infrastructure. There's the Pantoro gold mine, the Savannah nickel mine and the iron ore mine as well, which all put their product out through the port of Wyndham. So a project we can uh, easily build. It's uh, an area that can easily be mined and we're very happy to be there. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the project that we bought into the company in the middle of last year. Uh, we spent some money converting the resource uh, to Jork 2012, a 13 million tonne resource at 1.13% TREO. The style of the deposit is the same as the Mount Weld deposit, which is uh, famously owned by Linus and one of two only operating rare earth mines in the world. Uh, it's a weathered carbonatite. We have uh, the same mineralogy as Mount Weld, and we have the same sort of breakdown of rare earths, if you will, in terms of NDPR content. And the good thing about these style of deposits is they come to surface. They're very easy, free dig style of deposits with very low strip ratios. So the mining of this deposit will, will not be an issue for us. Next slide, please. 
So late last year, we uh, went out there and uh, did some passive seismic work to define the, the depth of weathering, where the rare earth should be accumulating in these channels, if you will, in the weathering profile. And we've managed to deliver a number of new targets that we need to get out there and drill. And uh, that's what we intend to do. Well, we had intended to do in April this year until COVID-19 hit, but we plan to be out there in July as we announced this morning. So next slide, please. So this is the program that we announced this morning, which we want to get out on the ground at Cummins Range again. And we intend to be out there in July. It's a four pronged attack on this project. Uh, we, we intend to spend some money increasing the confidence of the resource from inferred to indicated, and especially in the high grade portion. We also need to get some sample uh, for metallurgy to take to our potential customers down the line. And we also plan to spend a bit of money on growing the resource and making significant new discoveries within the carbonatite itself. So July is our target time to get out there and we're very excited to get out there again. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the strategy that differentiates us a bit from the other rare earth companies out there. You might be familiar if you've been around the rare earth space, but a lot of these companies have very large capital spends in the order of half a billion to a billion. And that's because they intend to go all the way to final product or intermediate product. Our strategy is to produce a high grade monazite concentrate, which has only been capable to be done in the last couple of years as China has moved from a, from a self-sufficient monazite production base to a production base that, um, that relies on offshore product uh, to come into the country and, and fill their refineries and make the rare earth oxide. So we believe we can build a, a simple uh, concentrator there, something very familiar to the base metal business. And we believe a 250,000 tonne type operation could, should cost no more than 25 to 30 million Aussie. So it's a strategy that can be achieved for a junior. Uh, we don't have large capex requirements and something that we can get on with. Next slide, please. Uh, this is not, another little project we picked up with the help of our geophysicist. So located about 80 kilometers north of Mount Weld. It looks like a dead ringer for Mount Weld in the geophysics and it's never had a hole in it. Uh, as soon as it's granted in the coming months, we plan to get out there with an air core, air core rig and do some cheap exploration. So we'll know very quickly what we've got there and it's an exciting project for us. Uh, next slide, please. So the other side of the business is the New South Wales copper gold assets, which has been getting a bit of attention real, uh, lately. And the reason it's getting a lot of attention is because our joint venture partner there, Kangora Copper, has been drilling and getting some very nice visuals on the initial drilling. This is a deal we did at the start of the year uh, with a very well credentialed team at uh, Kinkora Copper, led by uh, John Holliday, who was a, the principal discoverer of Cadia and actually had this Trundle project uh, himself when he was at Newcrest and was unfinished business for him. Uh, the, pro the deal we did is with 35% free carried in the asset and also a 10% holder in the equity of the company. So very, very leveraged to any upside and we don't have to spend any of it, which is even better from my point of view. Next slide, please. Uh, so the initial project that they're getting into is the Trundle Park project. It's uh, very near the North Parks um, mine that's owned by China Mollycorp and Sumitomo. Uh, it's a project that has had some very illustrious owners in the past, uh, Newcrest and uh, High Powered Exploration, which is one of Robert Friedland's companies. It has had some historic drilling on it before, but all very shallow, and it's got significant mineralisation in those shallow holes. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we looking for here? Um, we're looking for elephants, basically. Very, very big deposits, world-class projects uh, that ultimately end up being owned by majors. Uh, Cadia Ridgeway has been the backbone of Newcrest for many, many years. North Parks has been a workhorse originally for Rio and now moved on to China Molly. And Boda, the exciting discovery that's been made by Alcane uh, in the belt. Uh, it's really been the discovery by Alcane at Boda, which has uh, lifted the whole belt back into prominence. And it's uh, something we hope to emanate um, emulate with our joint venture partner, Kinkora Copper. Next slide, please. So Trundle, Trundle Park project is where we've uh, recently announced the results of our first hole. Um, the Kinkora team have been out there and completed a 680 metre hole. They have intersected mineralisation throughout the hole. Some very exciting, good looking stuff in a scan, um, proximal to a porphyry. The porphyry itself, uh, at this stage looks mineralised and we keenly await assays on that. Uh, so what we'll do with that one is we're waiting for assays. We've moved up north to Mordialac uh, to drill the next hole for the next two weeks while we wait for assays for this, which should allow us to target the next hole at this project. Next slide, please. 
So the Mordialac target, uh, very similar to the Trundle Park target. It's uh, got geochemistry and holes above and proximal to a geophysical target. So quite simple uh, targeting uh, and that one's going down at the moment. Hopefully we'll get some similar sort of results as we get uh, got on the Trundle Park uh, target and we'll have um, two real live projects on our hands here. So next slide, please. So as part of the deal, we uh, joint ventured a number of projects out to, um, out to Kinkora. Aside from the Trundle project, uh, we also have the Condoblin project, which is possibly a VHMS type target. We have a bunch of ground around, the, um, around Evolution's cow mine as well, which they'll turn their mind to. And also exciting that we have some ground south of the Alcane Boater Discovery at Condumble. And there, there was a, a company called Sultan Resources, which made some very interesting discoveries at, at surface um, that were trending into our ground at Condumble as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get out there as well this year. You'll also see a little project in blue there. That's one that's been returned to us 100% in their own right. We call it the Orange East Project. It's formerly an Alcane project, uh, and we'll, we'll, we might have a go at that ourselves 100%. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the Orange East project. I thought I'd just touch on this, seeing it's 100% owned ourselves. It's uh, about 12 kilometres north of the McPhillamy's mine, uh, discovered by Newmont and Alcane some 10, 15 years ago, and currently being developed by Regis Resources. It has a very similar um, signature to that of McPhillamy's. Uh, it has geochemistry, it's in the right rocks, and it has a high, high K radiometric uh, anomaly as well. We've just been given that tenement back and we'll have to do some negotiation to get on the ground, which we can do. And we plan to be out there probably drilling in our own right this year, unless we get a very good offer for the project. So that's something we're excited to have back and come into our stable. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the company uh, in a very quick uh, rundown. We're set up as a rare earth company with some exciting projects there. We believe firmly in the thematic of rare earths. Uh, as part of the EV revolution, both in electric vehicles and, and wind power as well. Uh, we're due to get out there drilling that in the next couple of months. And uh, while that's going on, we, our joint venture partner is making discoveries for us in New South Wales, which is uh, very exciting for us as well. So lots of news for the company going forward. We're well funded um, and we're well credentialed. So we believe we can grow this company into something very big in a short period of time. So thanks for that. If you've got any questions, I'm, I'm here to take them. Jeremy, great presentation and clearly a, uh, a sound strategy. Um, how have you found um, moving into what was a known area with a fresh set of eyes and a fresh set of technology? What advantages um, do you see and did you see coming into the project, particularly in WA? Oh, look, uh, the, the main, the main uh, thing that's developed in the rare earth business is the metallurgy uh, and also the, um, the marketing of the product as well. In the last few years, it's only been the last few years you've been able to sell a monazite concentrate into China, which is what our whole strategy is based on. And also a lot is, a lot is advanced in the world of uh, metallurgy as well in terms of uh, um, floating off the, uh, the monazite out of the uh, raw ore as well. So they're the two things we, we think will make a difference to this project that the other, other parties haven't been able to achieve. And in terms of your East Coast projects, apart from the one 100% owned, how pleasing is it to see results coming out with uh, little or no expenditure and leverage to upside? Oh, look, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it was one of the things in doing the deal I was very excited about was the 35% free carry. I haven't seen a 35% free carry um, as long as I can remember. So it's absolute upside for us at, at no expense. So it's uh, fantastic from my point of view. And are you able to share, we do have a question come in rela relating to mon monazite. I hope I pronounce that, pronounce that correctly. Um, do you have an understanding of what the market looks like or are you creating a market for that product? Uh, no, we're working uh, extensively with our um, strategic partner, Talaxis Group, which is a, um, a subsidiary of Noble Group. And they have been mandated by Chinelco, which is one of the largest SOEs in China to go out and get monazite product from, from elsewhere in the world to feed into their refineries. So it's, it's sort of a market that has existed up until recently, right up until now, but it's just exploding in the last sort of two years as China really needs more product because it can't get it from its own deposits. So. Jeremy, great answer. Uh, company clearly doing well, hit the ground running literally uh, very quickly since listing. Congratulations. No, thank you. Uh, been a very exciting, uh, 
start to life and we look forward to the future. Great. I'd now like to welcome our next presenter, Paul Roberts, MD of Predictive Discovery, ASX Code PDI. Paul, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along and, and listening uh, to the predictive story. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, uh, what we regard as a very exciting new gold discovery, a Greenfields gold discovery in the, uh, the Seguri Basin of Guinea in West Africa. Uh, next slide. And the next slide. Right, so uh, Predictive has, has been operating in West Africa for a decade. We're a, we're a gold exploration company. We, we are actually focused on greenfields discovery and we have a system uh, that we use to uh, identify good targets. Uh, and uh, over the last 10 years, we've done exploration in, in four countries in West Africa. And uh, we have a very large portfolio in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, particularly, and also in Burkina Faso. But in those areas, um, we're operating on joint ventures. Uh, there is some, uh, there have been some quite recent uh, a very good draw results coming out of the uh, joint venture with Resolute Mining in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, but from a market point of view and, and uh, from the, the change that's happened in the company, which is uh, really quite extraordinary in the last six weeks, uh, it's all down to a discovery that we've made in Guinea. Uh, in Guinea, we've been, we've been there for um, a, not a very long time. Uh, and uh, and out of that, we've, we've got this Kaninko Gold project, which I'm going to describe to you. Uh, we have uh, only six weeks or so ago, we, we announced the uh, acquisition of the Kundian project, which is also shown on that map uh, uh, and uh, in a very highly mineralized area. We're certainly looking forward to exploring that. But in terms of, of what's happening with us, money that we're raising uh, and uh, the company's focus, uh, Kaninko is, is plainly the main game. Next slide. Um, so actually, I might just start, given some of you might be watching what's happening to Predictive today, uh, to say that we've, we've had some uh, quite extraordinary days, and today seems to be another quite extraordinary day, and, uh, on the market at least, for Predictive. Um, uh, but what uh, really got the ball rolling was an announcement of the discovery of the Kaninko Gold Discovery in Guinea, and uh, the share price <coughs> went up 733%. Uh, in one day, which was the lar largest day of uh, single day gain of any stock on the ASX in, in the past three years. Um, and we're seeing a quite enormous day today as well, uh, exactly why is slightly mysterious to me, I have to say. Um, so we've got uh, currently 636 million shares uh, on issue. Uh, we've got, uh, we're in the, in the midst of a capital raising to raise a further 9 million, that's 6.9 uh, from private placement uh, to sophisticated investors and, and another 2.1 from rights issue. Uh, that was done at five cents. Um, so we, we don't think there's going to be uh, any difficulty completing that capital raising. It is subject to an extraordinary general meeting vote on the 10th of June. That is the private placement and the, uh, the rights issue closes on the 9th of June. So by the time we get to mid-June, uh, hopefully that $9 million will be in the bank and that will enable us to push forward, particularly on this Kaninko discovery. Um, the, the market capitalization is out of date. Uh, we seem to have, I'm not quite sure exactly where we are right now, but we seem to have, have hit 10 cents today. Whether we stay there or not, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, very exciting things happening on the market uh, with predictive. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a geological map of uh, northeastern Guinea, and the yellow and, and the green areas you see uh, uh, in the top of the map are the Seguri Basin, and then, and then we're on, on the margin of granites and, uh, and Archean geology uh, to the west and south. Uh, you can see our ground position there, that's about 900 square kilometres of, uh, of ground that we currently hold. Um, and I must say that even though we, we are uh, working very hard and will work harder on the Kaninko project, uh, the reality is that we will still continue to do, do some work um, elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, stalled drilling on the uh, Can Can property about 80 kilometers to the east of Kaninko. We expect to do that. Um, so there will be more work happening uh, across Guinea and obviously we're hopeful for more discoveries there and we've got a very good start. Um, but uh, our focus is, is uh, at Kaninko, which is, 
uh, only 10 kilometers away from, or 12 kilometers away from the Carissa deposit, which was mined by a company called Cassidy. It's a redevelopment uh, currently. We expect uh, that they will be bringing that into production in the next, uh, again, in the next couple of years. There is already a gravity mill there. Uh, and a new development uh, about 30 kilometers to the south, Johnny Gobolo or Kiniero, uh, was a semaphore mine that again looks to be a redevelopment which will come into production in the next couple of years. So we're in a busy corner of, of Guinea, um, uh, but uh, the fact is that in our area, uh, essentially no previous exploration, maybe a little bit of soil sampling, no drilling. Uh, so this is well and truly a, a greenfields discovery and the, and the area was selected not really, not on the basis of neurology at all, but on the basis of a, a targeting system that we've used across West Africa, which we call Predictor. Next slide, please. This is, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because it's, uh, it's the key uh, discovery slide. In fact, these results that um, I'm describing to you here uh, emerged uh, or were reported in, in February and then in March and uh, it had no impact on the share price. In fact, we were trading remarkably, given that we're around 10 cents today, we were trading at uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.6 cents at that, at that time. And what we found was uh, a, uh, a large footprint a power auger anomaly. Um, and uh, prior to that, we'd done some sufficient geochemistry. Uh, we have subsequently done a little bit of uh, ground magnetics over, over this as well, but um, We'd identify an area with some gold anomalism, not terrific, up to 1.8 grams in, in, uh, in rock chips. Uh, some workings, but very shallow workings. We didn't really have very high expectations here. Uh, but then when we did the, uh, the power auger, and these, these uh, power auger holes that you see, these little inverted diamonds on 80 meters square, we had uh, 18 holes um, uh, with an average value of one and a half grams. And uh, as you can see on this image, some quite high values in places. So it looks as if it, it could uh, be a broad zone of mineralization, but of course, um, there's a lot of anomalies that don't, don't, that don't uh, turn into being something very good when you drill them. But in fact, uh, what the drilling revealed uh, is indeed what, um, uh, what, uh, what uh, the power auger geochemistry suggested would be there, a, a broad zone of mineralization. I might also note that uh, uh, this shows the uh, satellite imagery beneath. Um, there's no sign of those workings and, uh, on the satellite imagery, which means that they're quite recent. Um, and so, you know, if you go back a couple of years, no one would have even known that there was gold up on this hill. Uh, and the fact that it's on laterite, uh, it means that we probably can uh, drill through the rainy season, which is quite important because obviously there's a lot of expectation on us now uh, to do more drilling. Uh, the rainy season is coming up uh, in the next month or so, and we'll run for three months but we think that we'll be able to continue drilling through the rainy season and keep providing news flow to the market and advancing the project. Next slide, please. So uh, this, is a, this is an image of uh, the drilling. Um, what, what you can see here, as you can see the anomaly again, of course, the power auger anomaly, quite large. You can see the dimensions, 450 by 300. Uh, we didn't have enough budget to drill all of this, so we were a bit selective. Uh, but when you have a look at this image, the thing that's most striking is uh, that the, the drill holes, which normally would show up as little black lines, are, are very largely obscured by the red bars. The red bars are reportable insteps at a cutoff grade of 0.25 a gram. And so what you can see is the bulk of the drill holes um, across this quite large area were mineralized. And, and while uh, most of the, the grades are, you know, uh, around a gram, uh, we have some high grades in here. And of course, uh, what's particularly striking is the 46 meters of 6.6 .6 grams which stopped the mineralization. All of these holes were only 50 meters long and they only went to 38 meters depth. Um, but what's interesting about it is it's open in all directions. So if you look to the north there along this trend, it's 300 meters before we see another hole. There's nothing to the south, there's nothing to the east. And then when you look on that section, you can see it's red all the way across and it's open to the west as well. So a lot of space to grow within uh, that footprint that's divided by the pink. And then of course it's open in both directions and we really don't know how big it is, although we have done some power auger drilling um, and we are expecting to put out power auger results next week. And uh, it's possible that anticipation of those power auger results has pushed up the share price so much today. Next slide, please. Okay, so 
Uh, a few things to talk about on this slide. So I, I want to dwell just very briefly on why we use a quarter gram cutoff. Uh, it's obviously a low grade cutoff compared to what most people would use. Um, but I, I would point out that in Guinea, the two large mines that are operating there are both operating on head grades of around a gram. Uh, the recovered grade at uh, Sigiri, which made money last year, um, was 0.75 grams a tonne, and a lot of that was actually primary mineralization. And what drives the economics of these low grade, um, or relatively low grade mines, is when you have uh, broad areas, broad widths of um, uh, oxide mineralization from surface. And that's exactly what we've got here. So, so uh, you can see uh, the red here, the plus 0.25, um, uh, you've got a, a width of uh, 120 meters here. So open to the east, open to the west, open at depth. Um, and, and obviously the, you know, the bulk grade is, is quite reasonable. There are some lower grades in there, but it's my belief that pretty well everything you see on this slide uh, would go into a mill. And the reason, the reasons for that is we're in saprolite and saprolite is soft. Uh, and so if it's not free dig, it's damn close to free dig. And secondly, the stripping ratio, obviously in this material is negligible. Uh, thirdly, it's all oxide. And therefore, though we haven't done the metallurgical test work, it's likely to be very good and therefore likely to get plus 90% recoveries. And fourthly, um, the, the material is soft and therefore comminution cost is also going to be low. So, um, uh, you know, a very good start and, and uh, with a lot of, a lot of very valuable uh, characteristics. Next slide, please. This is 160 meters to the north uh, and uh, a little bit further to the west. And, and here also we see the same pattern all in saprolite. So this pale yellow is all saprolite. Uh, a little of perhaps non-free dig in the first couple of meters in the harder um, uh, laterite, but that's about all. And, and uh, open to the east, of course, you can see this uh, vertical hole to the east, the power auger hole uh, that um, has not yet, yet been tested. So we can see a width here of 50 meters or so, and, and quite possibly um, it's going to be considerably greater. And then to the next slide, just the, the last of the sections I'm going to show you. So we, we managed to put in five holes here. Again, that's practically all red. Some of the grades are, you know, admittedly a, a little bit skinny, um, but uh, again, practically all of what you see is, is likely to go, all of the red stuff at least, is likely to go into a mill. And, and this drilling is just down to 38 meters. We are, we are um, uh, breaching just slightly into saprock here. Um, it's a material might be a fraction harder, but all oxidized. And I would imagine that, uh, um, the fresh rock contact would be of the order of 50 to 60 meters, but we're uh, yet to find out. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this is one system, the Northeast Bankan system. We think the gold is relatively fine here. We have, after we got the good results, we went to the highest grade samples and panned some gold out, but it's generally uh, very fine even in the high grades um, up on Northeast Bankan, and we see no sign of quartz veining. Uh, we're not quite sure of the protolith, but uh, a diamond drilling uh, drill rig is up there now, and we're drilling a deep hole underneath that uh, 46 meters or 6.6 grams as we speak. Uh, and so over the, in the coming weeks, we'll start to get some clues about uh, what's happening with the geology underneath uh, this big system. Um, yeah, here I'm showing a cross section through Bankan Creek. So uh, Bankan, sorry, it's slightly blurry on the screen, but. Um, uh, this is in the middle, there's another nice intercept, 44 meters of 2.06 grams uh, per tonne. Um, it's certainly open to the north and not effectively drilled to the north. The thing that's kind of most interesting about this is it's a different system. So uh, the lithologies, while we don't know what, what the lithologies are up at uh, Northeast Bankan, uh, they seem to be different. We're seeing some granites down here. And the grade is better at the bottom of the hole in the fresh rock. We've got this 18 meters of three grams. Uh, and certainly that's actually very useful information because there's always a bit of a question when you go from saprolite into fresh rock, whether the grades are going to increase, or they're going to de decrease, do we have super gene enrichment? All of those questions are always in the air, but uh, it's very reassuring that we're getting good grade down in, in the fresh rock. And obviously uh, if we're getting better grades uh, than in the saprolite, which is a conjecture at this point is the case, well then obviously uh, we've got uh, very exciting times ahead even on this project. Um, next slide, please. Right, so, so you've got a spatial idea about Northeast Bankan and Bankan Creek. 
Um, we would say that uh, in terms of, generally in terms of geochemistry, the soil geochemistry is not very effective. Uh, and so power auger drilling is, is the uh, discovery method of choice. And it's very important to do that before we get into the drilling because we are talking about uh, potentially quite large areas of, of potential here and just simple step out drilling with RC is not a very cost effective way to operate. And despite the fact um, uh, that we, it looks like we're raising quite a large amount of money, our, our DNA is still about being careful with money and that's not gonna change. And so we wanna use the, the power auger drilling as, a, as, the, uh, uh, as, as the method to, um, uh, to test. Uh, uh, for, for new mineralization before we go and drill. So we've got a large power auger drilling program planned. Uh, we are finding, uh, we have drilled about 1200 meters of strike now along strike, uh, you know, to the north and to the south of Northeast Bankan, and we're expecting results from that next week. Um, and there are other prospects on the per permit where we're going to do more. We've uh, programmed out of this $9 million funding, uh, 25,000 meters of RC drilling, uh, and we'll be expecting to do a, uh, and also 5,000 metres of diamond drilling. We're expecting to do about 8,000 metres of diamond and RC drilling, uh, on, principally on northeast Bankan over the next two months. The diamond drilling drill rig has now started. The RC rig would start in about a week. And we expect to do a, uh, a program of metallurgical test work um, at, between now and the end of the year, um, all with a view of bringing out a, a maiden resource uh, by the middle of next year. And bearing in mind, we've only had this property for 10 months now. So very rapid progress, and we're hoping to continue with that very rapid progress into the new year with uh, hopefully very good news for our shareholders um, by the time we get to mid-year. Next slide, please. And just very briefly, we're also operating in Burkina Faso, uh, sorry, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we've been getting some interesting results out of the Resolute Joint Venture. We do only have 23.5% equity, but uh, we are, and it's a funding share, and we expect to be funding that uh, uh, certainly in the current six months. And uh, next slide, please. Um, some results we put out on the 16th of April on, on a discovery that was first announced on 4th June. Uh, so some very interesting uh, material here. Next slide, please. Just some summary points. But uh, we're, yeah, we're in a strong position and uh, we're looking forward to the 12 months ahead. Thanks, Paul, a great presentation. And as you say, uh, just recently shook the ASX, which is always a, a great position to be in, uh, clearly results-based um, and driving growth. I do have one question before I let you go. Um, how are you using this capital raising and entitlements issue to reshape the register, if in fact you are? Well, the register is certainly changing as a consequence. Uh, we are... Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the, the emphasis, the, the larger emphasis was on the placement. Uh, and uh, we are interested in, in having, a, you know, a, a good a base of sticky money on, on the register. Uh, certainly, there's, there are, are um, uh, funds now joining our register. So we, the, the Lowell Resources Fund has always supported us, but we, we haven't really been supported by institutional investors over the last decade. And, uh, and certainly, we're looking uh, to expand, expand that over time. Uh, because we think as we drive this project forward and, and on the assumption based on initial results, a fair assumption that we're going to drive this forward to a development project, uh, we, we're certainly interested in having those, uh, those larger shareholders on board to help us support us as we take this through the next steps. Paul, a great presentation. I should give a shout out to Ben and the team of Hartley, who I know are assisting you with your capital raising and have done a fantastic job. So Paul, uh, exciting times ahead. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, David. I'd like to now introduce our next presenter, Justin Brown, MD of Element 25, ASX code E25. Justin, over to you. Thanks very much, David. So Element 25 is a little different uh, to the other Presidi 3 companies who all gave great presentations, but I think we can hold our own. We are basically a uh, WA-focused manganese developer. Um, and developing a very large 100% uh, owned manganese asset in, in Western Australia. Next slide, please, David. And again, snapshot of the company. We uh, have sort of just transitioned from being a micro cap to something a little more than that with a jump in the share price. Uh, we doubled on, on the day of the release of our pre-feasibility study. So we're well on our way to develop a status. Um, we've got uh, cash reserves of about $5 million and an EV of something around $30 million and, and hopefully trending north. 
Um, next slide, please, David. Very experienced owners team, uh, plus 100 years combined experience in mining and processing, all with skin in the game and all with uh, strong credentials in, in what we're trying to achieve with our project. Um, next slide, please, David. And that's about developing what we regard as a world-class manganese resource. Um, it's Australia's largest onshore manganese resource. Uh, we call it butcher bird. Next slide, please. And manganese, for those, just a really quick sort of snapshot of manganese for those that aren't familiar with it, it's basically a, a steel ingredient. There's an emerging market in the battery space. It's used in uh, NMC lithium ion batteries. And obviously that should grow uh, as that demand grows for that, that, that EV space. But predominantly it's a steel story. And um, that's where our initial product will go. Next slide, please. So what is Butcherbird? So Butcherbird is located about 130 kilometres south of the town of Newman. Um, it's a very large resource, currently drilled out to a joint resource of 260 million tonnes of manganese ore in measured, indicated and inferred categories. That's recently been converted to a made and proved and probable reserve of 50 million tonnes. And um, it basically sits right on top of the uh, Bitumen Highway and the Goldfields Gas Pipeline, which is great infrastructure advantages when you're developing a project in Western Australia, which often suffers from the tyranny of distance. It's 100% owned by us. Um, and as one of the, the uh, other speakers pointed out, WA is ranked as the number one mining investment jurisdiction globally, according to the Fraser Institute's latest publication. Um, and it's a long life asset. So we're currently working on a 42 year mine life, but that's only going to utilize about 20% of the resource. So this thing, when we get it up, we'll be going for a long time. Next slide, please. Just a bit of a bird's eye view. Uh, the uh, resources that we're focusing our development activities on are located in the colored areas. We've got red as measured, yellow indicated, and green as the inferred areas. This represents about a third or perhaps touch over a third of the global resource. There's a number of satellite deposits that sit outside this, but this is the area that the mining lease application that you can see in red uh, is situated at. And this is where our PFS focused in terms of our stage one development plans. And basically it's, it, this, it, it offers, you know, very simple low cost manganese units for whatever uh, end use we, we, wanna, we wanna pursue. Right now we're pursuing an all concentrate uh, operation. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, it's, it's a really simple beast. So it's a flat lying outcropping uh, super gene manganese ore body. It extends for several kilometers along strike. Uh, and at the first 30 years of production sit above the water table. It's free dig, there's no uh, drill and blast required. It's got a life of mine strip ratio of about 0.3 to one. Um, and it's, it's really, you just start mining ore straight from surface and you, you do it with very simple kit. Next slide, please, David. And so I guess what well, we, we've got some, some larger plans to, um, and we've been developing a, a very um, innovative, uh, efficient leach process. And we've, we've done quite a lot of work on, on a high purity manganese solution for this ore body, um, which will be best in class when we get it up. But what we've done for the, for the meantime is to look at a, a much smaller capital cost, low, a sort of low, cop, low CapEx, competitive OPEX, uh, concentrate exports, startup stage that will get cash flow coming into the company's balance sheet and allow us to, to uh, ramp up that larger development over the time. Next slide, please, David. And the way we do that, um, for those of you that know manganese will know that a 10% in-ground grade is not commercial, um, but we have some interesting geology in that uh, the manganese in our ore is, has been modified through the supergene process to form bands of, of hot, much higher grade manganese in amongst clays and shales. And so we've devised a process, very simple processing pathway that allows very low cost digging of this ore, a wet uh, scrubbing process that removes the fines and the clays. And then we've, we've done quite a lot of work and shown that optical ore sorting very efficiently removes the red shale material from the black manganese and leaves us with our uh, marketable concentrate that's, that's gonna go to market um, through Port Headlands. Next slide, please. So just a bit more detail on the flow sheet. It, it really is just a, just a few bits of kit um, that you would all be familiar with. I'm sure if you, if you follow mining, uh, it's, it's basically a dozer to rip and a loader to, to dig the ore, a pretty simple crushing uh, exercise followed by some dry screening. 
wet attrition, and then the optical wool sorting. So none of those bits of kit are anything other than routine and uh, they come off the shelf effectively and you bolt them together and away you go. And that allows us to produce a, what we call a medium grade concentrate with favorable impurity levels, uh, most of which are extremely low. Um, and it also has some quite interesting properties that may make it attractive for premium end uses as well. Next slide, please. And I guess the crux of it all, so once having, having done the metallurgy, we, we did, did the work to wrap a, an economic model, economic model around it. Obviously that included a, a, a pit optimization, uh, costings of, of mining and processing and logistics. Um, and what, what it turned out was with only about $15 million of capital, we can generate an operation that has a 42 year mine life and generates about $30 million of free cash per year with outstanding NPVs of, and, and IRRs of uh, 283 million and 223% respectively with a simple payback of six months. And if you, if you follow uh, mining economics, that's an incredible result. Um, and hence the, uh, the share price has reacted accordingly. We doubled our market cap in, in pretty much one session and, and hopefully we can continue that uptrend. Um, this is sort of, uh, I guess, a startup stage. It only utilizes about 20% of the total resource. So you don't have to be um, a mathematician to work out that you can pretty easily ramp this up, uh, possibly in, in year two or three, depending on how the uh, manganese demand side goes, which we have a pretty bullish outlook on. And look, we've used relatively conservative pricing assumptions and we've been a very, you know, it's a very detailed study. So our costs are well understood. And we think these numbers are very robust indeed. And it's uh, you know outstanding result from the team. If you go to the next slide, please. And if you look at the, the sensitivities, you can see that it's, it's very resilient. So even, even uh, you know, with worst case assumptions, our MPV doesn't drift below 150 or only just below 150 million. So uh, even if you get a few headwinds and we may well get a few tailwinds, if you look at the current spot manganese price, it's significantly above our price assumptions. So, you know, it, it'll be give and takes here, but I think um, you can see from that, that, that it's pretty resilient overall. Next slide, please, Dave. Logistics is, is key, but we've got some fantastic infrastructure at Port Hedland. Um, and we, as I said before, the Bitumen Highway uh, runs straight through the project. So we don't have to really build any logistics infrastructure. We just utilize what's there. It's not a massive exercise in stage one. It's about six or seven trucks per day. And it just simply goes out through the Utah Point bulk shipping facility, which is well equipped to deal with uh, manganese ore. In fact, has has uh, moved many tons of manganese ore over the years. Next, please, Dave. Um, pretty aggressive development timeline. We've got well advanced approvals and, and, and all the baseline environmental studies are complete. Um, we've got a, a project financing strategy, obviously a fairly modest uh, capital requirement shouldn't be too challenging to raise given the buoyancy of the current capital markets. Um, detailed engineering and approvals are underway as, as is project financing. Um, and we uh, have a genuine ambition to be in production Q1 2021. We don't, uh, we've done some detailed uh, analysis on that and we think it's very achievable um, and that's what we're working towards. So we're gonna be transitioning pretty aggressively over the next six months from a developer to a producer and generating positive cash flows. Next, please. Um, and I guess it, we're coming into the market at a time where manganese is pretty strong. Um, it's got some interesting supply constraints in that South Africa infrastructure is infrastructure constrained. South Africa is one of the main uh, sources of supply uh, globally, and they're having some issues in, in, in ramping up. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, please, Dave. You can see that demand keeps growing. So, um, you know, the, I guess China used to have a pretty strong manganese mining uh, sort of uh, production rate, but that's in, in strong decline. Um, South Africa's got infrastructure challenges. If you look at the Australian situation, uh, the, the three mines here are in decline. Uh, you know, Budu Creek's probably um, not, not too far from, from being wound down. Woody Woody's been going for a long time and it's deep and, and not necessarily low cost anymore. And Grid Island's only got about six years of reserves left. So supply is diminishing and demand's increasing, which means that pricing should stay pretty robust at a time when we're going to enter the market. So, you know, there's some upside on this PFS that we've delivered as well. Next, please. Um, and then just give you an idea of where our pricing assumptions sit um, in, in the, the, the long-term price trends. Uh, the red is, is the benchmark price that we've taken as our, as our, uh, our um, index for setting the price in our studies. 
And if you look at our oil and sustaining costs, it sits at that green line. You can see from that that over the last 10 years, um, we would have only lost money for a very brief period of time in 2016. At every other time, we would have made um, money and in many cases, more money than our model's currently predicting. Um, Macquarie just recently re released a commodity comment that was titled manganese ore stronger for longer. And we concur with that. That's supported by some analysis that Roskill's done for us. And, um, and we think that uh, it's a great time to be entering the manganese market. Next, please. So, and probably one more, David, please. Where to from here is the question, and I guess we're on a pretty clear pathway. Um, we've got a, a robust PFS that we're working to. There's obviously a bit more detail that needs to go in that, but we would call our PFS a PFS plus. It was a lot, it was a very detailed study. Um, there's a project financing hurdle to get over along with permitting and approvals. Um, and then we'll be in production generating cash flows. And we've got some exciting opportunities in the future to uh, either expand the bulk concentrate business um, quite simply, or um, to pick up the uh, downstream processing uh, sort of ambitions that we were looking at in, the, in last year and, uh, and then look at product diversification into various other parts of the manganese market other than concentrate. Um, and we want to be a, a significant global producer. Um, we want to, we think that the world, the demand for stable supply in, in an ethically operated and stable tier one jurisdiction is, is going to be strong. Um, and obviously uh, it economically stacks up very nicely and should generate returns for a very long time. Um, I think that's the last slide, David, if, if you click through, I think it's just to simply say thanks for listening. Well, there's a couple of photos. So uh, that's, that's just a bit of a bird's eye view of what the, uh, the, the project looks like. Um, exploration rig doing the drill out for the reserve, uh, which was completed last year. And um, that's an optical ore sorter that you can see down below, which is the bit of kit that has allowed us to, to take this to a commercial grade and, uh, and underpin this business model that we're looking at now. So um, thank you all for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Justin, a great presentation. I always love seeing photos of action on the ground, it means investors' money is being spent in the exact right spot. So. Congratulations, Justin. We do have a couple of questions and I'll get to them uh, as quickly as I can. Um, in terms of financing timeline, do you think there's a way to shorten that uh, or use existing shareholders to assist in raising that money? Yeah, look, I think there, I think there is. We're working through those options now. Um, there's obviously the PFS has generated strong interest in the investment community and we're getting sort of proposals for assistance from a lot of different sectors. We think that the existing shareholders should, should be invited to play a role in that. Um, we also think there's a good chance that our offtake uh, partners may play a role in that, um, as well as having a, a debt component to minimise dilution to existing shareholders. So yes, I think that's, that's likely to be part of the solution. And in terms of concentrate grade, is increasing the grade something that adds value to the project or, or is it more than enough at the grade that it's at? Look, I think the answer to those two to those questions is both yes. Um, we it works very nicely, as you saw from the economic study at current grade. But you know, you would always chase higher grade if higher grade means higher uh, sale price per ton, and that would improve the economics. So you'll always be looking to improve that. And in terms of opex, do you see uh, clearly the next phase of study will give you the answers? But do you see opportunities to refine your opex numbers? Yeah, definitely. I think what we've done is is use a, we've we've focused on minimising capital here. So, um, you know, minimising capital means you're using mobile kit, skid mounted kit, and potentially um, you know slightly higher labour intensities and and maintenance intensity. So there are opportunities either either before startup to slightly tweak those designs or uh, post post sort of production uh, startup turn some of that cash flow back into the project to bring those operating costs right down. Although in saying that, we, you know, we're somewhere around the bottom third of operating costs. So we're actually sitting in a pretty nice position to get going and we don't want to necessarily delay for the sake of, of chasing every sort of you know, half dollar. I mean, if we could find big savings, we'll chase them, but otherwise it's get up and make cash. Like you say, it's all about making that cash. That's what the investors are always focused on. So congratulations on the work done today, Jason, Justin, and we look forward to following uh, what will be a very quick progress, I suggest. Justice, thanks, thanks for your presentation. Cheers. As I mentioned, everybody, uh, the copies of these presentations will be on the Share Cafe website early next week, and also the individual presentations will be on the company page within the Share Cafe website. That does bring to a close our Share Cafe webinar for today. I'd like to thank you for joining us. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the pre presenters for providing such a great insight into their respective businesses. Remember, do your own research and where appropriate, seek professional advice prior to making investment decisions. We look forward to seeing you next week where we have another great lineup of companies and we will be keeping you informed of those companies as they're announced. Thanks and have a great day.